So let it be written. So let it be done. This is Tabletop Terrors. My name is Tim, and I run the channel Tabletop Terrors with my brother James. And we believe that everyone can be more creative, and we use tabletop games to prove it. Now, this is Offhand Attack. This is a live stream I do wherever I can. Often, it's from my car, simply because that's convenient. Today we're going to talk about telling the best story for your campaign. And this is advice that I wish I would have gotten a long time ago. Um, but before we move forward with that, a Tabtarian toast. And I'm doing a, uh, an Ultra Sunrise in honor of my buddy Drake because uh, he is running an incredible Dragon Green campaign. And I think this is one of his favorite monsters. So, toast with me. May you mend the first break. May you kill the first snake. And may you conquer everything you undertake. Ah, Slancha. Matt Click is here. He says, what's up, Jabroni? What's up, Jabroni? Nathan Thurston, Sean DeJazo, Matthew Knapp, Kristen Logie. What is going on? Matt Click says, was that a booger hanging off the bottom of that monster? Oh, boy. Ooh, a free piece of Latucci. Um, um, I'm barely human. So... Marquise Hardis is here. Rob Coletta, Trim Tim. Carol Dunstan, this last is not, I'm trying to do it. <laughs> it's not breaking down. Uh, what's up, Drake? I just did a toast to you, my man. So, <clears throat> I don't want to disparage the current campaign I'm running in. In fact, it's the best campaign I've ever run. The next game for our Dragon Green campaign is going to be this coming Saturday. It's March 11th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, you'll notice this campaign doesn't have a name yet. That name is going to be revealed in the coming session. Um, the, the entire genesis of this campaign taught me a lot. We decided, the group decided, that we were going to run a Dragon Grin campaign, and we weren't going to decide anything before we started. So I prepped like three sentences, and the rest of the team, the team, I'm still in work mode, the rest of the players... <laughs> Decided on some, some very high-level character concepts, but part of the fun of what we wanted to do was explore that together and explore Dragon Green together in a total sandbox campaign. Now, it's important to know that I want to spoil you right now. Normally, I give you a warning and I say that you need to leave because there are going to be spoilers, but for right now, I want to spoil you. And I want you to trust me on this because... You can still watch the first three sessions, but consider this the director's commentary. Those first three sessions are going to be a lot better, I think, if you let me kind of talk you through some things. So there are spoilers. If you do want to turn back now, you can. I won't hold it against you. But let me spoil you. Let me feed you some delicious... Here, eat this. Eat this. It's spam and eggs. Matt made it last night. So, here come the spoilers. I decided that I wanted to open the campaign so different than you start in a tavern. So the joke we made was I, I started in the tavern Dragon Grin style, which was essentially a crucifixion. So as the night rolled on and as the first session kind of rolled out, I realized it was a cool story. It was hyper immersive. Everyone was having a great time. But because we didn't do a session zero and because I didn't know exactly what story we were trying to tell, the next session... I just sort of introduced more pieces and kind of let that go. Add this person and this thing and this faction and this happened. And then by the third session, I still, I didn't identify this at the time, but I still didn't know exactly what story I was trying to tell. Now, what did I do? I placed more pieces on the board. Um, I went bigger and grander in scale. And so because of this, the game was a ton of fun. The players are amazing, and the story was a lot of fun to tell and to listen to. So we played some solid D&D. But as far as a campaign goes, what I realized is that I was trying to tell every story. Understand that a very real thing is that as one of the co-creators of Dragon Grin with James and Matt and Barker, I feel pressure to make sure my Dragon Grin campaign is on point. Um... It's the creator's campaign, you know? So what I found myself doing was trying to outcool the last session. But I was going down the wrong path. 
And I think sometimes we can do this as dungeon masters. What is cool does not necessarily mean what is the best story. And so what I found is the best way to find out what story your campaign is about is to find out who doesn't like what your players are doing. And this sounds really simple. It sounds really weird, I think, probably at first. But stop trying to tell every story. That's my main piece of advice. Let your campaign have a specific story. And I'm going to spoil you, and I'm going to tell you what I think the story is now and the kind of tone and the feel um, of what the story is because now I have a very clear picture of it, and I'm excited in a way that I wasn't excited before. But first, let's go to the chat. Nate Vanderzee is here, one of the players in the campaign. And again, I want to make sure you guys know is that um, the game was amazing. All three sessions, absolutely incredible. The time I had, memorable. The Nothing disparaging. But I'm bringing it kind of to a new level. And in fact, I'm not going to do this, but it, I, I was tempted to call this season two, even though it's only been three episodes making that a trilogy and then having this season two, episode one, because that's how it feels in my mind. That's how it feels in my creative soul. Bill Mangan is here. He says, what's up, Timmy boy? Oh, Stephen Bax says, I don't even have a monster to tap. Already did. Already at the gym now. Keep me energized. All right, man. Marquis said he's toasting with a banana instead of a drink. Hey, man, I'll take it. Slancha. Slancha banana. <laughs> Matt Lennington says, Slancha. So Matt Click says, the worst part was that lettuce has been in the cup holder for like three and a half weeks. Yeah. I mean, that's it. I mean, I don't want to get pedantic. I think the worst part is that I ate it, but, <laughs> but that is the close second. Enoch said, I toasted with my Mountain Dew kickstart. Hey, man, rock and roll. Hey, oh, Tim, says Kristen. He says, does the toast count if you have water? Absolutely. The toast counts if you raise a glass and you drink with me because you're a Tabtarian. Nash Smith, nom, nom, nom. Matt Click says, I just made leftover Spam and Eggs burrito for lunch. Oh, girl. Oh, Matt. Mm. You make me want to break my diet with your delicious food pictures. Matt makes the food I want to eat all the time. If I had the money, I would just hire Matt to live in a food truck. I'd be like, hey, man, what's for breakfast? Matt, wake up. Go make me breakfast at the food truck. <laughs> Stephen, Big, Stephen Back says, ooh, ooh, child. Things are going to get easier. Ah, Jonathan Lutz says, ah, the classic case of spectacle creep. That's a great word for it. And yes, it's exactly what happened. Rob Coletta says, stoked for a new Dragon Run session. I'm building a pillow fort, especially for viewing it. Rob, if you send me a picture of that pillow fort, I will share it to the Tabletop Terrors page. Alan says, hey, Tim, a toast to you. What's up? Dill Shoulders is here. Nash Smith says, a trilogy of trilogies. I would contribute to the Matt Click food truck. So would I, man. We need to do, we need to do a GoFundMe for the Matt Click food truck. So I want to spoil you. By going back through the sessions, and I had Chris Wilhelm, um, I had Michael, like, a couple of people wrote some really awesome recaps, and they got some free swag out of it, some free t-shirts, which are on their way. Um, but by looking through the pieces and following Matt's advice, which is essentially look at the pieces you have on the board and kind of go from there, instead of adding a new thing to try to make it bigger and better, I thought, okay, what's happened? And let's really zoom in at the repercussions of these events. <clears throat> so the first thing is, my players were crucified. That's how we started the sessions. So during that crucifixion, there was this sociopath, this well-dressed mastermind named Donovan Stain. And he basically sadistically and ritualistically crucified them trying to achieve something. Now, there are two important things to know about all the things I'm about to tell you. The first one is I'm retconning several minor details that don't take away from player agency. Uh, names, tiny things that kind of fit together now that I have a clearer picture in my mind. So that's the first thing. It's okay to do that. This is a collaborative storytelling game and what's most important <clears throat> is that the players have a great time and that I have a great time telling the story. So it's okay to change minor details so long as you don't retcon things that would feel cheap. That would feel like you're taking something away from the players or, um, you know, retconning an important decision that takes away agency. I'm not doing that, but I'm dialing in some names, dialing in some relationships. Um, so that those are the things that you need to know. The crucifixion done by Donovan Stain, 
it ends in Ephraim Seidler, Matt's character, using Mage Hand for the first time and stabbing him in the throat. And so that happens. Now, this is after Barker's character, Jeremiah Diggs, smashes Donovan in the face with this crossbeam that he's being crucified on. So I'm thinking, I'm like, all right, what would come of that? So as they continue on their adventure, there are a few people that are killed. And in addition to the people that they had to kill to survive, there were others who were murdered in this whole process by Donovan and his you know, forces, the Stain crime family. Now, I decided that the story I want to tell and the story that these pieces tell, that's really a better way to put it, the story that the pieces on the board are starting to tell is this is like a Coen Brothers movie. This is a story about five people who were put in a really tough situation. The cards did not fall in a good way. And they had to kill someone to survive. And that person that they killed was the brother of a crime lord. Keeping it that simple, immediately I started to, to feel the conflict. I started to realize that this was the story that I wanted to tell. Five nobodies running away because they killed a somebody. They had to. The Dragon Grid isn't fair. And it doesn't matter the situation that Donovan put them in. And so I started imagining how this would happen and, and the way that this would go. And I started thinking about this person named Savick Stain. I introduced Savick at the beginning of session three. And we haven't heard much from him. But I know that I decided to do an Irish accent because I just wanted him to be foreign or an immigrant or something. I don't know. Um, but he's the leader of the Stain crime family. He's deadly. He's powerful. And in the wake of his brother's murder... He basically is going to spare no expense hiring bounty hunters to track down these five people and kill them. Find out all he can about them and kill them. To me, that's really interesting because now it's a contained story. I don't have to be worried about the dismembered Lord. I don't have to be worried about what's happening in the further parts of Grin. This is about these people who are in a situation that they can't escape. There is no winning. And that's, to me, the theme of this campaign, which is, there is no right way. There is no winning. What are you going to do? What decisions are you going to make to survive? And who's it going to piss off? Let's check the chat. Let's see here. Oh, man, I'm way down. Let's see here. <laughs> Matt Clicks says, holy crap, Rob, I'm going to build a pillow fort to play in it. What a great idea. That's going to be so good. Matt, I want you to know that I <laughs> this is going to be the craziest thing out of nowhere. I had a dream about Matt's cat, Vince, that he <laughs> he was an anime cat that saved my life. I, it was the craziest dream. I'll tell you more about it later. But I was like, Vince saved my life as an anime cat. And it was the, <laughs> it was the best dream I've had in a long time. Ken Napper says, I ran into the same problem with my Spelljammer game. I kept trying to outdo the last session, and it led to a really bogged down slog of a space race. So, here's the spot advice that I wish I would have had, which is, don't let the decisions, don't let those big events go without consequence. Because as Dungeon Masters, what we'll do, we smash this big glass box, and then instead of looking at the broken pieces and deciding how sad these smash pieces are and what shapes they make and how this affects everything around it. We just slide the glass off the table and put a new glass box on there every session. And that's not fulfilling. That's no promise and response. There's no fulfillment there. So what I realized was the story starts here. I don't have to have some big, you know, continent spanning provoker style game for this to be the story. That's not the story we're telling. The provokers don't start out crucified. Nah, at least not until season three. So, then I realized the players didn't have a sense of the location because I had failed to give them true pillars, at least simple names, to sink their lore teeth into. That, As players, when they start kind of spitballing and riffing, I gave them nothing to cling on to. So I started by simply, okay, for this next session, I'm going to establish some very simple names for this region. Everything is taking place in what we're calling the Dust Mouth. The Dust Mouth is a small, negligible region in Northwest Grin. 
it's mostly rocks and sand. There are a few like thriving cities, but really <clears throat> it's this place where bleak storms flash in and out. It's got extreme heat, but it's largely untouched by the dismembered Lord because it's insignificant and it's ridden with po poverty. Like think a mashup between sort of the landscape of Texas with the movie Gangs of New York. And I started getting this thought and I was like, that's the dust mouth. That's the location. And already, <clears throat> just telling that to the players, they have some things they can sink their teeth into. Jonathan Lester says, there's a YouTube channel called Extra Credits that has a great video on spectacle creep in video games. Cough, cough, Call of Duty, cough, cough. I, and I love the, the name, spectacle creep. It's such a, and again, I think that it, what we realize is that by outdoing ourselves, outdoing ourselves doesn't mean a bigger set piece. I think outdoing ourselves means a stronger emotional pull. Linking events to people in a way that's meaningful and you're going to have moments that stick with you. Um, I did a stream a few weeks ago on um, Manchester by the Sea. One of the most sad and moving movies that I've seen probably in the last 10 years. And there were no spectacles in that movie. It was character to character interaction and tragedy. And it was it it was real. There are a few scenes that just stick with you. And to me, that's a better solution than spectacle creep. So that I will check that out, Jonathan. Thank you. Carol Dunster says, Love the first session. And I know you're at you're at work with me. Oh great. Now I'm at work with you. Eric says, That was a neat start for Dragon Grin. I appreciate it. Oh, Chepe's here. What's up, man? Sammy Tobias says, Hey. I've got my first campaign running as a DM. The party's been following the main quest and are to return to town next session. Any ideas for side quests to give a party in the middle of the swamp? Yes. It doesn't matter that they're in the swamp. Take something that they did. And what is the sequel to that? Here's what I mean. Who did they tick off? There's always someone who's unhappy with the outcome that the heroes are happy with. So that thing that they sought to achieve and that thing that they pushed and risked their life and limb to accomplish, who doesn't want that to happen? And have them in the town, uh, you know, asking around or some agents of that person causing trouble or doing things to unseat what was just done, things like that. So take any of the conflicts from the current campaign and what's the sequel to an opposing force. It doesn't even have to be a villain. It could be political opposition or someone with different, uh, you know, ideals as far as anything the party believes in. That's what you do. Uh, and then you set it in a swamp. And then thematically you can skin it as hags or, you know, something like that. That would be my thought. Matt says, Ephraim's in deep doo-doo. He is, man. In fact, uh, there was a scene where I, and I totally borrowed this from the movie Serenity, where I wanted to introduce Savick Stain. And so I had him kind of leaning down over this hologram of the murder scene, sort of having this mage do a replay holographically of... <laughs> Now I'm imagining the knife going, ah, oh, ha, oh, ha. He's going, rrr, 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 rrr. no, Savick is replaying his brother's murder. And he's watching, you know, Diggs smash his brother's face. And then he's watching this dagger sink into Donovan's neck. And he's seeing that it's Ephraim and Diggs. Those are the two guys. So the, the, the third session begins with bounty hunters being set on them. Uh, again, heavy spoilers here. The third session ends with Kathleen, Cassie's character, being shot through the eye by one of those bounty hunters. Um, because this is Dragon Grin, and you don't kill the brother of Savick Stain without expecting some sort of repercussions. And so that's how I introduced Savick and the murder and kind of replaying that. So by I didn't pay enough attention to that thread in the moment. And so what I'm going to do now is that's that's the main plot of this game. And there are other small things that each of the characters wants to do. But guess what? It's kind of tough to do what you want when you have a crime family seeking you for killing one of their children or brother in this case. Jonathan Lutz says, it sounds like you're treating the first three sessions as a single pilot episode, setting up problems that will escalate the, as the game continues. That's a great way to put it. That's exactly what I'm, I'm doing. I'm treating it exactly like that. Um, and again, going back through and taking all of the pieces and saying, what is the sequel? No more adding new pieces, but how do these pieces interact and fit together so that the conflict feels real and that these players feel like they're in danger and it makes sense? 
Nash Smith said, it's a dragon grinny and A-team, crucified for crimes they didn't commit. Actually, that's exactly what it was. Legit. Eric says, had a very Elder Scrolls start on steroids. Yeah, actually. Curtis Conway says, Savic Stain, nice. Rob Cletus says, great thinking, Tim. I have a sequel idea for your campaign. Donovan's second cousin kills the party's familiar. John Wick and Dragon Grim, baby. Rob, that's where we're headed. Marquise Hardis says, are you going to bring back up the war makers and the kidnapped children, or will that merely be set dressing later on? We will bring that back up. But here's what I decided. That's the overarching plot. So there will be answers to that. There will be things that occur with that. Those threads will not be left untended. But to me, that's the main arc of the season, if this were a television show. So that's finale stuff. That's mid-season finale stuff. So those things will play an important part. But what I realized is I was trying to write a season of a television show with no transitional episodes. And if you really look at sessions one, two, and three, they would work well as session one of a television show, the midpoint finale of a television show, and then the season finale of a television show. Uh, what I did was I just skipped all the transitional episodes in between. So that's why I'm looking at this as sort of a season two, because transition doesn't have to mean middle, doesn't have to mean boring. It can mean rich with character. Um, and that's what I'm going to do. So absolutely, you will see those things in play. Drake Warren says, exactly what I've tried to bring to my campaign. This is exactly how I imagine your setting. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. And Rob and Matt are going to be fort buddies. And Matt says, Tim and Vince became best friends on the fold-out couch two summers ago. He misses you, man. He is. I slept on Grandma's bed, and Vince was my buddy. Like, legit, like... You would, have, you would have thought he had known me for years because he kind of like tuckled up right around my side and we just slept. That cat is a familiar. Jeremy Lilly, what's going on, man? Sean says, off topic. I hate work sometimes. I always get interrupted during Tim's broadcast no matter what time. Rest of the day, no interruptions. Rant, LOL. I know, man. I feel the same way. Sometimes I got to watch the clock a little closer than I like on these streams. Nicholas Ashmore says, I was having this problem in my game. I tried to make it about complex political intrigue, but I ended up just dumping too many pieces onto the board, and the players just wanted nothing to do with it. Oh, man. So they left. Oh, no. I realized that wasn't the story they wanted to tell. Now they're much happier with the game, I think. That's a very mature decision as a dungeon master. Um, I know a lot of dungeon masters that would not make that decision, and then they would slog through the campaign, not realizing why no one's having fun. So that's actually a really solid choice to make and say, okay, this is a collaborative story. That's not the story you want to tell right now. Great. And kind of make it a backdrop piece. That's very mature, man. Also why, if you can, it's important to do session zeros. We purposefully didn't do a session zero, but that is one of the things that a session zero accomplishes, is if everyone says, no, nah, don't want the political intrigue, you can kind of skip the step of slogging through for a little while before you change it up. Paul says, stain on their souls. Actually, dude, I was already thinking of the, the different play on words we can do with stain and stuff like that. So cheers to you, man. Ben Buckner, you can escalate with Savick. If the PCs kill him, that would create a power vacuum and maybe even draw the eye of the dismembered lord since Savick was an important, if small, cog in the machine of his empire. It's exactly what it would be. What it would happen, I already know this in the back of my mind. If something happens to Savick or if the, if the plot starts getting too big, before the war makers and such start coming into play, there is a, a Lord of Ash who is over that region of Dragongrin who would certainly start to get questioned. Like, hey, what's going on in your region? And then he would have to step in, which most likely is where these war makers and marrow came from. Not like the dismembered Lord just sitting there with a seeing sphere, like, kill that town. You know, it's more, there's a dark hierarchy to things. <clears throat> And so, yeah, absolutely that, man. Drake Warren says, Paul, Hamlet. Tyler Hurst is here and Morgan Grover. <laughs> Matt says, Tim, Vince is tuckled up to me right now while I try to work. He's a little tuckler. Jonathan Lutzer says, cats are the best. Marquise Harder says, I think if I was running this, I'd say the trilogy were the prologue and that the next session is the official session one. And then Matt clicks says, I agree, Marquise, like the opening credits happened right after Kathleen got shot. I absolutely. And if you can think of a way to do that, I mean, should I rename the set? Because I'm going to name the group. You've got the Winds of Sorceline. You've got the Provokers. Uh, you've got the Lore Keepers. There's a name for this campaign. 
it just came to me as I was prepping for this session. So I'm gonna work it in without forcing it. And what I did was I decided to go with a name for the campaign based on the pieces that were on the board. So, you know, all the names that I was trying to come up with in session two and session three, the reason they didn't fit is because I was naming the wrong thing. Um, but now I know what the story's about. It's a Coen Brothers movie that takes place in a dusty, nowhere portion of Grin where five people have to try to survive injustice. And when they survive, the world's not that great anyway. I mean, that's kind of the way it goes. So that's very, very good. Uh, Marquis says, I would just rename the sessions of the first three as Prologue Part 1 or whatever, how you want to do it. I might consider really doing that. I genuinely might consider doing that. Uh, Chepe says, what's your favorite way to generate stories? There's a saying that a king dying is not a story. I've heard this. But a queen overcoming the grief of a king's death is. How do you make the difference between a series of events and unrelated conflict from a narrative? How do you personally try to make a storyline out of the ideas you want in a game? That is a great question, and I feel like that is what I've sort of unlocked here. And it's, to me, sort of the advice that I was given before, which is, who is affected by whatever you decide? You have to start somewhere. But when you place that piece on the board, give that piece a desire. So in the instance right now, the person, the, the person who has really pushed all this into motion was a man named Donovan Stain this well-dressed sociopath, this mastermind behind this crucifixion, I had to decide, Donovan Stain wants to crucify five people. Now, in an RPG, you have the luxury of not deciding why. Uh, in, a, in a written game, you can, in a written story, rather, like a novella or a book or whatever, you sort of have to have an idea by the time you're finished with why he's doing it. One of the things I've learned is it's better, actually, to just have rough ideas and as the players start to make choices, fill in the blanks and so the first piece you have to place has to have a motive. It has to affect the world. So you can't just put Donovan Stain, he's a bad guy. No, Donovan Stain, he's a handsome, well-dressed sociopath that talks like this. And he wants to crucify five people. Why? I don't know. I still don't know, really. I have an idea, but I'm going to let that kind of play out. Now... From there, the players are forced to either act or die. So by putting them in that situation, there's, a, there's an inciting incident. Now, I didn't know what was going to happen, uh, specifically to Donovan. I didn't know if he was going to die or not. But him being murdered, that's when I decided, okay, how do I decide the difference between that story, that narrative you're talking about? If I would have let Donovan's murder just be a passing thought... I'm missing the best opportunity for the story. So what I'm starting to learn to do is say, who cares the most about what just happened and disagrees? And that's your new foil. That's your new conflict. That's your new, you know, that's, that's the thing or the person or the creature that now cares and wants to retaliate. Because this is how life is. This is humanity. I mean, look at politics. One party says one thing. What does the opposing party say? Um... Think of it that way. And but that's how, to me, that's how I separate it. So you have to place one interesting piece on the board, let the players react, and then depending on what their reaction is, who would dislike that reaction the most? Now that's another piece I'm going to place on the board. Um, I, I'm going to come up with a, a name on the fly for this next part. These are B plots. I mean, I guess you call them subplots. Each of the characters should have a little thing that they're in the middle of. So like, for instance, with Garrick, that's Nate's character. He became a warlock. So now he's kind of like, oh man, I'm stuck in this contract. Um, his little thing is, his family wants him to take over the farm, but he wants to go out adventuring. It's in his blood. It's kind of what he wants. That's his little thing. That's his little minor conflict. So in the face of this big conflict that he has to challenge or you know, overcome this challenge immediately, there's little ones. Uh, Ephraim. Ephraim has some questions about his parentage. Um, there are just different things, you know, that each of the characters has told me specifically, like, hey, I kind of want to, this is the question I want to answer for my character. So I have B-plots running in the side. Here's what I'm learning. Anytime I can tie that B-plot answer to something generated by that main engine, that immediate piece, so Donovan and the crucifixion, that's a bingo. 
So for me, I immediately, uh, and I made, I made a, uh, a living, I keep calling it a play test. It is a living recap document. I totally ripped that off from Matt Click, but I made a recap document and I'm letting the players edit their locations and their names, but it has all the locations, the factions, NPCs, the players. I will be sharing this before the game. Again, the game is this Saturday night, March 11th at 8 p.m. Eastern. What I do is then say, okay, Nate's character has a family who wants me to take over the farm. So that's his mini like, B plot. Tying it to the fact that Donovan Stain is part of the Stain crime family, well, I'm going to make it so that the Stain crime family leans on the farmers of the area and makes them pay protection money. So, because that makes sense to me, that's realistic. There's a couple of, it's called the long fields, and they're basically, the, it's one of the few reasonably fertile areas in the dust mouth. The farmers are required to pay money to the Stain family so that they don't succumb to unfortunate circumstances, if you know what I'm saying. So hopefully that answers the question. So place a piece, allow the players to react to it. Then from there, who hates that reaction the most? Introduce them. If you can tie that introduction to some of the subplots that the players want to solve, bingo, that's a Yahtzee. I'm mixing my games. Jonathan Lutzer says, hmm, thinking about stain in their souls, like the Dresden Files and the Wizards can pull off the death curse. They have a couple of seconds to do so before they die. Ooh, that's cool. Enoch says, in my campaign, I have a simple main quest for now, but the main quest is tied in some way to everyone else's personal quest. It's great. He says, basically, there's an assassin. It's part of a crime syndicate whose leader is a rogue warlock that made a deal with a fiend. The fiend is connected with two other players' backgrounds. So... Basically, he's saying that the decisions of his players don't just affect the main plot, but the subplots, and that's key. That's that's a great way to do it if you can pull that off. Andre Torres is here. Ahoy, mateys. Let's talk D&D. Jason Smith is also here. What's up, man? Andre Torres says, I hope Donovan comes back somehow. I don't know, man. That resurrection in Dragon Grin is pricey and painful, so I don't know. You know, we'll see. We'll see. Enoch says, Andre, maybe Donovan comes back as a revenant or a vampire and comes back for revenge. Yikes. Matt says, if Donovan comes back, Ephraim can hopefully use this line and stay dead this time. Starting, hopefully the encounter starts with, we've got company. That would fulfill one of my bucket list items. Andre Torres says, yeah, there are tons of ways, but it's hard to choose narrat narratively. You don't want to diminish his murder. <laughs> Marquis says, a vampire turning Donovan into a vampire spawn would be great. But that's because of my vampire bias. <laughs> that's funny. Matt Clicks says, Tim, that's so smart, connecting things like that. Similar to what I've done in The Provokers, connecting a clarity to Bronze Eyes to tie Kristoff into it. Matt, I shamelessly steal your good DMing. And it, it, this is what I do. I realize that you place pieces on the board and then connect them in a peripheral way and then let it ride. So dude, it's smart because you came up with it. Sean DeJesus says, I love the living recap document as well. It is set up nice and I feel my players can use it. I totally used it as well. I will be sharing that. In fact, what I wanted to do was give the players today, maybe, maybe tomorrow, uh, an opportunity to edit their character descriptions and then edit the locations they're from so that it's, you know, what they want it to be. And they can also use the rest of the document to inform their choices. Then once they kind of do that, we're going to share it. I'm also going to do some dossiers where I'll probably share their finished um, player character descriptions with their character art so you can kind of remember who they were and pose a question. This went really well today. Um, I basically just pointed out, hey, I'm going to blame all the players for all of the murders in the area right now because the Stain family says so. Like, the locals know that there were some foreigners and as far as they know... Like, six people are dead. The way that it's painted is, hey, you got some mass-murdering maniacs roaming around the countryside. So, that just makes sense to me. So, again, thinking of it in, in terms of what would be, you know, sort of realistic, it's like, that makes sense. The locals wouldn't be like, oh, well, uh, Donovan probably killed Bart. And old Gal was dead in his shack. No. They think that the players killed Donovan, Bart, old Gal, um... Who else? Grendel? 
Grendel Portis. You know, like this, uh, this is how I'm going to paint the picture. So I will be sharing that. And Ben Buckner says in Dragon Grin, hero is a four letter word and I really like that about it. I hope to be able to do what you and the other members of Abtab have done with main plots and subplots. You certainly will. Andre Torres says, the Stain family seems like a great pillar to this campaign. It is. And that is exactly what I want to make the final point of doing is that, and I'll kind of wrap up the stream by saying, that was a piece on the board. By using that method and saying, okay, who cares the most that Donovan is dead? And I didn't want to go, the dismembered lord, because the dismembered lord doesn't know who Donovan is. Who cares the most? And immediately, I have a brother. And so I, I was like, okay, that kind of hits home. If someone killed my brother, it'd be on. Like, you know, you're talking about murderous revenge. So then I thought, all right, so what's a worst case scenario? The brother of Donovan isn't just some chump. He is the guy that you don't want to piss off in the dust mouth. So now that's a campaign. So absolutely that's a pillar. And then it gives kind of a deep stable of enforcers and contacts and bounty hunters. And it's like, I don't know how this campaign's going to end. I'm okay with killing the characters and making this a, like a legit Coen Brothers movie and making it a story about the unfairness of Dragon Grin. I probably could have chosen a better word, a little more powerful there. Matt, edit me. Um, but anyway, I'll wrap up with the comments. <laughs> Matt says, who cares the most? Occam and his Razor Scooter. <laughs> Matt Click coined the phrase Occam's Razor Scooter, and it's probably my favorite description of keeping things simple. Chris Wallam is here. Uh, so I want to close with this. I am going to try something new with this campaign in this way. Um, simply for practicality's sake, based on viewing metrics, period. I'm going to try this. If it fails, it fails. We go right back. Um, what I'm going to do is we're going to stream this live for about four hours, Saturday night at 8 p.m. After the stream is over, the, document, or the video will not be public. You have to watch it live if you want to see the whole thing live. After that, I'm going to work hard to release one video every day or two with each part of the campaign. Uh, not campaign, session each part of the session. This is because the bounce rate for the live videos on the Tabletop Terrace YouTube channel is about 22 minutes. My thought is, even if the, if the scenes are a little longer than that, I'm not gonna cut them to 20 minutes on purpose, but I feel like it is not as easy for people to commit four hours to anything, especially playing in a game themselves, let alone watching it in pieces. And so I feel like there's a drop off rate that I'm gonna try to combat. This also is gonna allow for us to make uh, the audio rip uh, you know, 20 minutes or 30 or 40 minutes. So essentially each one of the major scenes in the session will be a separate video. I'm just going to rip it off YouTube. No fancy, nothing, no, just literally splicing it, re-rendering it and putting it back up as part one, part two, part three, whatever. So I'm going to try that. So if you can, I suggest watching it live. Um, if you want to see the whole thing at once, but if not, like I said, it will not sit on the drive. I promise you my goal is every day or two to have the next part up so that people can watch it and stay caught up is really what it's about. Um, I want to try to, I want to try this. So we're going to see what happens. Let's see here. Let's see here. Uh, and Andre says, yeah, but I definitively, definitely escalated up to the dismembered Lord in the long run, but that's just my take on it. Either way, I bet it would be a wild ride and I might. There's a part of me that also thinks that it is much more, it is, full of so much more despair if the dismembered lord never even knows like they don't even matter that much that's a little more sad you know so anyway we'll see but here's what i want you to do if you're watching this video on facebook be sure to crush that follow button so that whenever i go live or james goes live or we go live together you'll be able to get a notification if you're watching this on youtube i want you to go down to what i'm calling the dungeon the dungeon is the comment section go down to the dungeon and you get 50 xp for all of the things you click on and subscribe to. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on that. Make sure you check out Absolute Tabletop. Make sure you sign up for our e-newsletter. Make sure you follow us on Twitter. And most of all, make sure you stay awesome. So, until next time, may your dice roll high.